Well, good morning, everybody. It is a great honor to be here. Nance and I have come to love uh, Ben and Shauna and love cheering on this church. And I have been looking forward to today. You're in a series, Waiting Without Fear. Um, so I want to start just with waiting, and then we'll get to the fear part. Um, we have a hard time waiting, most of us do. In San Francisco, when I first moved here quite a few years ago, there was a cardiologist named Meyer Friedman. He was in his 90s by then. But he's the man who coined the term type A personality. And um, a lot of people who have type A personality wrestle with uh, heart issues. That's part of why Meyer was involved with this. The primary symptom, he said, of type A personality is what he called hurry sickness. The sense that there's never enough time I always got a rush. I hate to wait for anything. Those folks, among other things, are more likely to have heart disease. One of the ways that he confirmed this diagnosis was his upholsterer said that the chairs in his office had a really interesting pattern of where they were out on the edge of the chair first. Everybody that was waiting to see their cardiologist was sitting literally on the edge of their chair. People with hurry sickness, which he said is an epidemic in our society, feel constantly rushed, preoccupied. You have a hard time being fully present. You're always worried about the future. You tend to overthink things a lot. Hard time trusting God. So just to level the playing field, I want to do a mass confession of hurry. And if you think you might wrestle with hurry sickness, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand just to let everybody else know. Not yet. Hang on. Let me <laughs> describe it first. Uh, so, for example, if when you're driving and you come to a stoplight and there's two lanes and there's one car in each lane, you find yourself guessing based on the make, model, and year of both cars, which one is going to pull away faster so you can get behind that car because God forbid you should get behind the slower car. Or when you go to the grocery store and there's a couple of checkout lines open, you count how many people multiplied by how many products in each cart. And then if you're really sick, not only do you do that, but like if you get into line A, you keep track of the person who would have been you in line B. Because <laughs> if you're still in line and that person is done sooner, you're depressed. Now that you know what it is, how many of you think you might suffer from early sickness? Very sick church here. No big spread. We hate to wait. Epic, you all know you're waiting for a new building. What a great day that will be to be able to. But man, waiting for construction. When's it going to happen? In waiting, I'm not in control. I don't know how long I'm going to wait. You go to the doctor's office. Doctor doesn't have to wait. What do they call that little room where you sit there till the doctor will see you? Waiting room. Doctor doesn't have to spend any time in the waiting room. We don't like sitting in the waiting room, but we all got to spend time there. It's part of the human condition. We wait. To live is to wait. Waiting for something. Not just that. Um, the topic that we're in in this series is waiting without fear. And that's a wonderful topic, but we can only move towards that one step at a time. So candidly, today, I want to talk to you about mostly about waiting with fear. Because you can't Wait without fear until you learn how to wait with fear. And I'm waiting in my life, and I feel a fair amount of fear. So I mostly want to talk to you about waiting with fear. There are areas where I'm waiting to see how the future will turn out. Will something bad that I'm afraid of happen? And I would turn the fear off if I could, but I can't. Uh, the way that anxiety works, anxiety is very future-oriented, and it will try to get you to imagine scenarios and then figure out what if, what if, what if. Anxiety almost always involves that little phrase, what if, what will I do if? And then I try to solve that one, and then there'll be another what if. Anxiety has a lot of what ifs. And sometimes church can kind of make it worse for people. Sometimes people worry about stuff, and then they come to church, and they hear a message that says, um, if you're worried, it means you don't trust God. And so now they're worried about what they were worried about, and they're worried that they don't trust God enough. So I want to say a word about this injunction in the Bible, don't be afraid, don't fear. Because it's a bit different, I think, than other commands like don't be greedy or don't steal or don't lie. Uh, I know a lot of people who, like, they kind of want to be greedy or they kind of want to indulge lust. Or they, 
kind of want to blow up at somebody. I've never met anybody who says, I would like to experience massive amounts of anxiety. I know God invites us to live at peace, but I want to shake my fist in his face and just experience huge amounts of terror and panic. Never known anybody who wanted that. I'll go a little further. In a group this size, some of you here, and you suffer from what's called general anxiety disorder or panic attacks, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety where just going to church fills you with dread, and yet, and yet, you keep getting up, you keep praying, you keep having the struggle, you keep seeking to work and to love and to worship God. And I just want you to hear real clearly, you are some of the biggest heroes I know. You are fighting a battle that no one in your life, nobody but you and God know about. And the church, this church, wants to be a place that cheers you on. So I want to reframe a little bit. In the Bible, most common command is don't be afraid. It's not quite the same as don't lie or don't steal. Those are behaviors, and we're actually able to pretty much control our behaviors by a direct act of the will. Don't be afraid. Fear is a feeling, and you can't uh, control a feeling by an act of the will. We all wish we could, but we can't. So you might think of it today more as kind of an invitation. At about the darkest moment of my life, a number of years ago, during the Advent season, I was reading these passages where over and over, Mary, Joseph, shepherds, don't be afraid. And the thought that came to me was, John, you don't have to be afraid. Not because nothing bad will happen. Some bad things had happened in my life and worse things were going to happen. Uh, but the thought that came was, yep, terrible things happen in this world every day to all kinds of people, and I am with them, and I will be with you. Now, you need wisdom. You don't actually have to be afraid. It's okay if you love somebody and they're going through something that's really kind of scary. Love doesn't mean you have to be afraid for them. You don't have, I will be with you. And then a big part of what this means is, um, don't let fear keep you from doing what God's calling you to do. I have a friend who knew that he needed to have a really difficult conversation with a very powerful person, and he was terrified of this, and he was walking with his wife, and he said, every time I think about having this conversation, my palms get sweaty. And they kept walking and talking about it. About a half an hour later, he said, Every time I think about having this conversation, my mouth gets dry. And she said, well, why don't you lick your palms? <laughs> she didn't have a real big mercy gift, but, you know, palm licking time comes. So this invitation isn't, you know, feel guilty if you fear. It's God's with you. There is an invitation to another kind of life. We'll get towards the end to how deep that goes. But there is a grand invitation. There is one who is with us. And while we wait with fear, we can seek to obey. And that brings us to Mary. I don't want to think about what did she have to fear, what did she have to wait for, so that you and I can kind of learn from that. Uh, her story begins with the angel Gabriel coming to her. You will conceive, give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. He will be great, be called Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, we would tend to think this would be good news for Mary, and she would say, this is great. I get to be the mother of Jesus. It's like I'll be Mrs. God. All generations will call me blessed, except for Protestants. It's a little Protestant joke there. Nobody will get it, but that's all right. <laughs> I'll be like Mrs. God. People will revere my name. Hail Mary, full of grace. I will have a football pass named after me. My face will be presented in pictures more than any woman in the world till Madonna. In fact, Madonna will be named after me. But the text does not say that Mary was greatly thrilled. It says, but Mary was greatly troubled at these words. Now, we have this problem when we read the Bible uh, very often 
we assume that characters like Mary knew from the beginning what we know looking back on, on them. It's great. Danish thinker Søren Kierkegaard wrote, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. We wait. We worry. And here's what was going on with Mary. She's young. She's engaged. She's pregnant. And Joseph, her betrothed, was not the father and knew that he wasn't the father. So she would have been regarded as an adulteress, guilty of adultery. Uh, in the Torah, the book of the law that governed her culture, to be guilty of that meant that a woman was supposed to be stoned. If by chance Joseph chose not to have her killed, he would still be required by Torah not to marry her. So, in these first moments, at best, her best case scenario is she'll be left destitute, ostracized by her little village, a uh, victim of scandal to raise a son who would be regarded as illegitimate and, and excluded from the community. Now, of course, we know the story didn't turn out that way, but young Mary did not know that. She had to live in the space of not knowing. That's where anxiety lives. What if, what if, what if? I don't know. And she wrestles a little bit in this passage with Gabriel, and, and she ends up saying, I am the Lord's servant, let it be with me as you have said. And when you're waiting, you have to kind of decide, what am I going to stand on? What will the foundation of my life be? And for her, where she lands is, it won't be on my marital status, having a certain kind of family, living a certain kind of life. It is, uh, I am God's child, God's servant. I will seek to identify with and trust and obey God, no matter what. Mary actually begins to suffer for Jesus way before Jesus ever suffers for Mary. And she goes on in Luke 1 to pray one of the most famous prayers in all of history. You might have heard of it. It's sometimes called the Magnificat from the Latin version of the very first line of the prayer. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now, to magnify something is to make it great, to dwell on its size and its strength and its impact. It is something that I do with my mind. While I'm waiting, I will always magnify something. But it's tempting to magnify my problems. What if, what if, what if? When our first child was born, Nancy handed the baby over to me, and I had a moment I had not anticipated. I held that tiny, tiny little blob, and I had this uh, image of the trajectory of her entire life. And I said to Nancy, it's overwhelming to me right now to just think of this little baby that I'm holding is going to grow up. It's going to happen and develop, and life will unfold. This little skin that I'm holding that is so pink and smooth is going to get mottled and wrinkled and blotchy. And this little hair, Lord, I had a little strip of red hair like a little mohawk on her little head. This hair that is copper right now will turn gray and then white. And then we will grow old and we will die. And then she will grow old and then she will die. This little baby that I'm holding right here. And Nancy said, let me hold the baby. You're going to creep her out. <laughs> we all have this sense of the aloneness of life. What if? What about? What when? And I can magnify that. I can magnify my problems. I can dwell on them. Or I can magnify my God. And Mary, whose mind is filled with Old Testament scriptures, that prayer of the Magnificat has all kinds of references to Old Testament scriptures, she magnifies God. He is considered his handmaid. He is able to cast down the rules. Uh, that prayer is so subversive. In the 1980s, it was actually made illegal to pray it or read it in public in Guatemala. Because the fact that that prayer talks about God is able to tear down the mighty from their throne, tear, bring down the rich and so, 
It's had this kind of subversive impact on humanity. So Mary's got to wait. And then Joseph gets visited by God, so he does marry her, and, and they're going to wait together. Then uh, Jesus is born, and Mary and Joseph take Jesus into the temple, and there's an old man there named Simeon, and he takes the baby into his arms, that little baby, and he prophesies over that baby what's going to happen. And it's a wonderful prophecy. This child will become great and is destined to cause the rise and the fall of many. And then he adds words that are addressed just to Mary, not to the baby, not to Joseph, just Mary. He says, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now that's an unusual way to end the blessing. Beautiful baby. What a wonderful, and a sword's going to pierce your life too. Have a nice day. And now she has to wait not only to see what will happen to her son, but what is the sword? The sword's going to pierce your heart. She'll have to worry about money. Anybody here ever worry about money? In Israel, when a woman gave birth, uh, she was to offer a lamb as a sacrifice for the child. There was an exception. In Leviticus, it says, but if she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons. Mary could not afford a lamb. They were too poor. And you know how that is. Somebody else has a baby, and they have lots of means. They have a beautiful christening gown. All you can afford are hand-me-downs. Priests take the other families with those lambs first because... Life is that way, because if you're poor, you wait. Every mom wants the best for her baby, and this is Jesus, but it's all Mary can afford. Maybe that's her sword, that poverty. Gang, you all know this, maybe more than anybody in the world. We live in a place that says, uh, you can be free from worry if you just have enough money. That'll buy you peace. That'll buy you security. That will bring you contentment. And it is rarely acknowledged that between uh, more and having enough, having a peace, there is a chasm nobody has ever crossed yet. Uh, I'll put it in the form of a question sometimes. Who is more content the man with a million dollars or the man with 12 children? The answer is the man with 12 children because he doesn't want any more. <laughs> you have to think about that one for a minute. Um, You've got to worry about money her whole life long. She'll have to wait to see what Jesus' destiny is going to be. Everybody has dreams for their kids. We actually have kind of a hint about Mary's dreams for her kids. It doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, in Mark chapter 6, we're given the names of Jesus' brothers. People are talking about Jesus, and they're, they're kind of skeptical about his claims and identity. And they say, isn't this, that is Jesus, Mary's son? Notice they don't mention Joseph. Joseph probably dead by now. And the brother of Jacob, Joseph, Judah, and Simon... Aren't his sisters here with us? In case you're wondering, Jesus' sisters' names were Heather and Brittany. I just made that up. That's not true. Nobody knows what their names were. be fun if they were. Um, but we're given the names of his brothers. Uh, uh, I listed them in their Hebrew form. You might remember Jesus, Jesus and Joseph and Mary have to flee from Israel when he's real little because of a genocidal king, Herod, and live as refugees. A lot of volatility, a lot of violence in the Middle East in Jesus' day. He knows about our world. Mary knew the Old Testament story of Israel trapped in Egypt being liberated by God to go into the promised land. And the names of her sons, not just Jesus, which is Yeshua, salvation, the one who saves. Names of her the brothers refer to that. Jacob, Joseph, Judah, Simon were all patriarchs, all heads of tribes of Israel. 
One writer says those names were a kind of a prayer. God established my son, Jesus, Yeshua, Savior, and his brothers, the new patriarchs, the new leaders of Israel who will deliver us from Rome and Caesar the way Moses delivered us from uh, Pharaoh in Egypt. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Maybe that's the sort. Just worry about safety. When Jesus turned 12, they took him back to Jerusalem, back to the temple. And on their way home with their relatives, we're told that Jesus stayed behind at the temple, but they were not aware of it. And they lost Jesus for three days. I think losing a child is one of any parent's worst nightmares. We lost one of our kids at Chuck E. Cheese and one of them at Disneyland. We got them both back, but I still get sweaty palms thinking about it. Imagine how you would feel if the child you lost was the Messiah. (laughs) They get to the temple. Jesus is there being Jesus, astounding people. And it's interesting. It's not Joseph. It's Mary who speaks. Joseph never talks in the New Testament. Mary does. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. She is not the only parent in history ever to ask that question of a child. Why have you treated us like this? What do I do when I can't control people? Can't fix them? What do I do with my children? And Jesus isn't even apologetic. Why are you searching for me? He said, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand what he was saying. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient in all things. And then this little tagline, again, just of Mary. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. The last phrase get used a couple of times in uh, the early chapters of Luke to describe Mary. After he was born and the shepherds were sent with the angel's message to go out, we're told, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And people often think about this like just kind of a hallmark moment with you know herbal tea and scented candles and so on. It's not. New Testament scholar named Scott McKnight writes, the language that Luke uses to describe Mary is the language that's used in the Old Testament to describe the prophets who sought to discern what is God's activity, what are God's judgments in our world, and to bring that word for people. That's what Mary's doing. Mary is the one who gets it. When you ponder... Instead of resisting and denying reality, you simply acknowledge and accept it and ask, God, what are you doing here? And when the anxiety comes, instead of trying to push it away by willpower, which never works, which you just simply, yep, that fear is here. God, that fear is here. And instead of trying to fight it, you just accept it. I know it's a true story of one woman who's wrestled with anxiety. She always tried to push it away, never worked. So she finally gave her anxiety a name. She calls it Wilma. And when she feels the anxiety comes, she just says, welcome, Wilma. Okay, you're welcome here. Now, God, would you be with me? Would you help me to ponder and magnify you? And instead of guilt and resistance, if you just... Okay, God, be here with us in it. Mary will have to wait when things are going on she does not understand. Jesus becomes a man and begins his public life, and Mary's been waiting for this for 30 years. Only he does strange things. He breaks the Sabbath. He's supposed to be a holy man. He touches unclean lepers that no rabbi would ever touch. He lets a prostitute bathe his feet with her tears and then dry them with her hair. He eats with sinners and tax collectors. Everybody expected the Messiah would 
get rid of sinners in Israel. And, and he parties with them. And the Pharisees, people that, again, we look back on the story and that's kind of a bad name in our day. It wasn't back then. These were devout folks. These were people that anyone would anticipate is going to rally around the Messiah, but they decide to get rid of him. So Mark 3, verse 21, you know, this is Mary's life. When his family heard about this, that about, about the nature of Jesus' ministry, the stuff that he's doing, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Now again, this is Mary, gang. She believes Jesus, that little baby she put in the manger, is mentally disturbed and confused. So Jesus is teaching. People let him know that Mary has come. Notice his response. People say, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, how do you think Mary felt? I'll tell you what. If I was speaking somewhere and someone were to tell me my 87-year-old mother had come looking for me, and I were to say, who is my mother? I can tell you exactly what she would say. She would say, I'm your mother, and you must be out of your mind. And here's Jesus saying words that she cannot understand. Here's my mother, not her. And he goes right on talking, leaving her outside. Maybe that's the sword. And this waiting, confusion, worry, fear goes on. That's the last time we see her until the end. John 19, 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. And you have to wonder, whatever you think about the whole Jesus story, his status, deity, and so, what was that moment like for him and his mom? Did he try to keep her away? Now she has to watch this. That little body that she loved, that she carried in her womb, that she placed in a manger, that she bathed, that she fed, that she clothed, that she rocked, now that body is nailed to a cross. And we're told when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple who he loved, that's John standing nearby, said, woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. And the disciple took her into his home. Now, you remember, she had sons. But now there's come this division in her own family around Jesus. And they take him down from the cross. And they pierce his body. And Mary remembers those words that she has carried for 30 years. And a sword will pierce your heart. We do see her one more time in the final chapter of the book of Acts. After the resurrection, Jesus gives final instructions to his followers. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Notice that word there again, wait for the gift, my father. They had to be so, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting all this time. And now there's the resurrection, but more waiting. And then the Holy Spirit's going to come. And then, and we're still waiting. Advent, you know, means we're waiting for him to come back and set everything right. In the meantime, there is a kind of healing that goes on. They all join together constantly in prayer, along with women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now there's been healing for her family, and she's together with her spiritual family and her biological family, and they're still waiting, but now in hope. I have a a kind of a mentor, Dallas Willard, and he said, part of the gospel of Jesus, the presence of God, the incarnation, God with us means this world is a perfectly safe place for you to be. I'm not there yet. I'm longing for that day when I can wait without fear. I'm not that there yet, but I'm moving towards there. Jesus said, if you trust me, the one who trusts me will never taste death. There is nothing that you can fear, Paul says, for I'm convinced that nothing, height, depth, um, Angels, demons, powers, principalities will be able to separate us from the love of God. 
when we had two kids that were real small, the, the third one the baby was in with Nancy in a hotel room. We were staying at a hotel with a pool. And um, uh, uh, I had warned the kids, you know, you can only go in the pool one at a time when I'm holding you. If you go into the pool by yourself, then something really bad could happen and you could drown. And apparently I warned them a little too uh, vividly because uh, one of them was jumping to me and the other one just slipped into the pool and went under the water. And I reached in right away and pulled her up, but she was just sobbing. And she said, oh, Daddy, I drowned, I drowned, I drowned. And I said, no, honey, you didn't drown. This isn't drowning. You were perfectly safe the whole time. Your daddy was always watching you. So let's not tell mommy about this. <laughs> Your life was never at risk. Your well-being was never in doubt. You had a father that was there the whole time, and his eyes were never off you, and his arms were strong enough. Now, see, that's the message of Jesus. That's the faith with which Jesus lived. Now, with this God who is all good and all competent, positioned as he is, he is watching you every moment in this world, as crazy as it sounds, is a perfectly safe place for you to be. You can wait. I'm not there yet. But there are people. There's a woman I know, Marty Ensign. She told me about a real person in our day. Uh, his name was Ben Yoni. She, she worked for many years part of a, a, a faith-based organization in Africa. When a genocide was going on, as you may know, in, in Burundi and, and Rwanda, and there was a young man named Ben Yoni. And uh, he was a remarkable person, came to faith in Jesus when he was quite young. He loved to sing. He loved music. They called him Ben Yoni because that meant little bird. And uh, he would make instruments for himself. And he was always singing. They would sometimes have uh, services. Uh, writer, speaker from Holland, Corey Tenboom, you might have heard of, would sometimes come and speak, and she always wanted Ben Yoni to speak. He just was this kind of infectious spirit, was able to go to school there, and, you know, was a class leader, and then became a teacher in a little village school and became a headmaster. And then one day during the genocide, because anybody who taught or had any kind of an education was regarded as a potential enemy, Marty told, uh, soldiers came. And they asked for Ben Yoni, he was the headmaster of the school, and they told him uh, that he and his 11 uh, fellow male teachers would have to leave. And he tried to talk them out of it, but could not. And so they marched all 12 of those young men out of that school. And one of the young men said to the soldiers, just sobbing, uh, please kill me first, kill me right now, because I can't stand to watch my friends shot. And Ben Yoni said, no, 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 I'm the leader. They will kill me first. And you will see what a glorious thing it is to go into the hand of God. It's a real person. And then he said to the soldiers who were there, um, could I pray? They had never been asked that before. They said, okay. And so he began to pray. And his friends were really glad. They trusted his prayers greatly. And they thought, Ben Yoni's going to pray us out of this. 
And he did pray for them, but mostly just prayed for courage for them. Mostly he prayed for these soldiers, and he said, God, this terrible thing that they're about to do is going to be too much for them. It will destroy their souls. So please, God, sometime send them somebody to tell them about Jesus and that it is possible for people to be forgiven. That is his prayer for them. And then they marched them out beyond the hill, and then Benyoni said, uh, before you do this, could I sing one song? Little bird. And they said, okay. And he began to sing an old, old song. We used to sing about it in the church that I grew up in when I was a kid. Out of my bondage, uh, sorrow in night, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come. Into your freedom, gladness, and light. Jesus, I come to you. Life without fear. See? The last verse of that song, and by now, all 12 of those young men are standing there singing this song together. Out of my fear and dread of the tomb, Jesus, I come. Into your joy and presence, thine own, Jesus, I come. And then they finished the song, and those soldiers shot and killed all 12 of those young men. And Marty asked, you know, if they were all killed, how do we know that story? Well, what happened then was the soldiers went back to their compound, and they all went to the nearest pub and they drank as much as they could to get drunk as fast as they could, except the lieutenant. The lieutenant didn't drink a drop. He was just haunted by what had happened. And so he looked up, an elderly woman, she's a Quaker min, uh, missionary who lived there, and he told her this story. And, and Marty said, these were people that live with a great deal of fear of death. And he said, I have to know what kind of God they worship that would enable them to face death like that. I want to know that God. And so she told them the story of Mary's son, Jesus. People have been telling for 2,000 years all around the world. And that lieutenant gave his life to Jesus. And he started telling other people about it, as people are just prone to do. Started all kinds of Bible studies, created enough of a problem that they eventually killed that lieutenant. But by that time, the movement was just too widespread as it tends to be. That's life without fear. This world is a perfectly safe place. I'm not there yet. I have a long way to go. But I got no alternatives. I got no good second options. Do you pray together with me? And the team's going to come on back up here. Uh, but in this moment, now God is right here. God is right here. He's right here. That's Jesus' message. Maybe today your prayer is what Mary's prayer was on that early day. I am your servant, God. I want to be your servant. I want to belong to you. I want to surrender to your will. What a great season to make that commitment. You can do that right now. God, would you forgive my sins? Be the leader of my life, my friend. Maybe you're here and you carry a burden. You're worried. You're afraid. There's something. Your work or your money, a relationship, your body, your health, death, a child, a parent, a friend, anxiety. You don't have to feel guilty about it and you don't have to try to push it away. You can just bring it to him. He'll take it like kind of a gift. You know, trying to carry worry alone just cripples us. 
but when we bring it to God, when we share it with each other, a kind of healing comes. It really does. So now, God, we bring all of our fear and all of our worry to you. And we lay it at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name.